So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. Today is, of course, the third in our series of uh, Brick Court lunchtime webinars of litigating abuse and dominance cases. And the subject for this seminar is litigating big tech and big data issues. Now, uh, for my own part, I've seen some of the difficulties that these cases uh, present um, in the 1980s, as some of you very old in the tooth may remember, I was one of the team of lawyers representing IBM in its uh, battles with the commission. Then in the 2000s, I was on the general court bench in the two Microsoft abuse cases. Uh, but these are in many ways now somewhat old hat. Uh, data has now arrived as the, the new currency or the new oil where control of the sources is said to be crucial. And uh, as I'm sure many of you listening will know, IP rights uh, is a field where, where competition law once feared to tread, but has now become a major focus of activity. And our three speakers today are going to offer you insights into uh, each of these areas. Um, we kick off, uh, if I can be forgiven for using a timely metaphor, with Sarah Ford QC, uh, who's speaking on uh, Article 102 TFEU and Chapter 2 Prohibition and FRAN, Fair, Reasonable, and Non-Discriminatory Rates for IP uh, Rights. Sarah is a leading silk in the field of competition law. She appeared for Unwired Planet in the first appeal uh, concerning FRAN to be heard by the Supreme Court, uh, and she's now currently instructed for uh, Optus in its FRAN dispute with Apple. Uh, I will pass over to her, and then I will introduce the second and third speakers as their turn comes. So, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to start off with a, a bit of background on FRAND and abuse of dominance. FRAND is a concept which was introduced as a solution to a competition problem. And the problem arises when you have standard setting organisations such as Etsy, and they get together and agree technical standards for all manufacturers to comply with when they manufacture a particular product. In Etsy's case, it's telecoms. And that obviously has positive pro-competitive benefits in the sense that when manufacturers comply with the standard, they know their products will be interoperable with other products and they know that they will work in different jurisdictions. But it also gives rise to a potential competition concern. And the concern is that if a patent holder has a patent which covers technology which has been included in the standard, that technology becomes essential for implementers who wish to manufacture products which comply with the standard. And the risk is that that puts the patent holder in the position that they can exercise hold up. So they could, in theory, uh, hold implementers to ransom and extract excessive royalties for the use of their technology if the implementers want to comply with the standard. So the solution was to require patent holders who have patents which are included in the standard to give a FRAND undertaking. And so what they do is they contractually undertake to license the technology on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. And the Supreme Court has recently confirmed that English courts have jurisdiction to settle the terms of a global FRAND license. So FRAND litigation is a growth area in this jurisdiction. And where FRAND goes, allegations of abuse of a dominant position seem to follow too. The obvious reason for that, perhaps, is that the holder of a standard essential patent has 100% market share. If we can go to the next slide. The relevant market is the market for the licensing of the standard essential patent. And so because only the patent holder can license the patent, the patent holder, by definition, has 100% monopoly over the market. Now, that conventionally creates a, a presumption of dominance, but it doesn't mean that the set holder is guaranteed to be dominant. And you can see that in particular from what was said by Advocate General Wathale in Huawei and ZTE, where he said the fact that an undertaking owns a set does not necessarily mean that it holds a dominant position within the meaning of Article 102 TFEU. If the fact that anyone who uses a standard set by a standardization body must necessarily make use of the teaching of a set, thus requiring a license from the owner of that patent could give rise to a rebut rebuttable presumption that the owner of that patent holds a dominant position. It must, in my view, be possible to rebut that presumption with specific detailed evidence. So the Advocate General is contemplating that in litigation uh, under Article 102, 
as a first stage, it is possible to rebut the presumption of dom dominance and demonstrate that you're not dominant, notwithstanding that you have a 100% market share. So in what circumstances might a SEP owner successfully demonstrate that they're not dominant? Conventionally, under Article 102, what you have to consider is, is there any countervailing buyer power, which would mean that the undertaking find itself unable to act independently of competitors and consumers, even though it has a high market share. And in the FRAND context, there are at least two potential sources of countervailing buyer power, and they were identified by Mr Justice Burse in Unwired Planet. We go to the next slide. The first potential source of a constraint on market power was the FRAND undertaking itself. Mr Justice Burse found that the fact that the SEP owner has given a license, given an undertaking to license on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, means that it's not open to that patent holder to simply walk away and refuse to license. And ultimately, if the parties aren't able to reach agreement as to what constitutes FRAN terms, the implementer has the option of going to the court and asking the court to set the terms of a FRAN license. And all of that gives rise to a degree of countervailing buyer power on the part of implementers, which effectively counteracts the 100% market share. The second possible countervailing force is the potential for holdout on the part of the implementer. Holdout is the opposite of hold up in the sense that it means that it's the implementer which is delaying taking a FRAND license and which is seeking to be licensed only at below FRAND rates. And in the context again of Unwired Planet, Mr Justice Burks was looking at the potential for holdouts and he pointed out that this is a particularly odd form of market because the patent holder is offering to license its patents on FRAN terms. But in reality, the implementer isn't actually interested in a license because they have to pay for it. What they want is access to the standard and the information you need to implement the standard is available publicly. And so what the implementer can do is to manufacture products which are compliant with the standard and to do so without actually seeking a license for the patents. And then it's left to the patent holder to try and pursue the implementer and to try and to take steps to enforce the patents and to extract fair remuneration for their use. And on that basis, Mr Justice Burse found that there was a clear potential, at least on theoretical grounds, for holdout on the part of implementers. And in Unwired Planet, he went on to make factual findings about the extent to which there had been holdout in practice in that particular case. And Ultimately, the, the, the conclusion there was that the patent holder did have a dominant position. But what this tends to suggest is that in the right case, if you have the right factual evidence to suggest that there has been a practical holdout, you might well be in a position when you can argue the contrary and say, no, notwithstanding the 100% market share, I don't actually have a dominant position in this market. So but let's assume that the conclusion is reached that you do have a dominant position. Turning to look at what might constitute an abuse in the FRAND context, what we find is that the conventional heads of abuse apply, but in, in, in some respects with slightly different emphasis in the FRAND context. If we uh, go to the next slide. One example of that is the abuse of excessive pricing. And the conventional test for excessive pricing is the two limb unwide uh, United Brands test. So you need to show that the price which is being uh, asked is excessive. And also in the second limb, you have to show that it's unfair, either in itself or compared to potential comparator products. And that's the, the fairly conventional test that's applied. But when you look at it in a FRAND context, there are some nuances involved. And again, this was considered in the first instance in uh, Unwired Planet. And what the court did first was to look at the interrelationship between FRAND and excessive pricing. And what it says was, if a rate is too high to be FRAND, then it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an abuse contrary to Article 102. If a rate is FRAND, then it's definitely not abusive, but a rate which is not FRAND is not automatically assumed to be abusive. So you then have to ask, well, when is a rate abusive in a FRAND context? And what the court said was that a core element of the FRAND uh, environment is that it contemplates 
that patent holders and implementers will engage in negotiations, good faith negotiations, to try and determine the, the, the terms of a FRAND license. And recognising that that part of the FRAND framework, it was said that if you make an offer which is too high in the context of good faith negotiations, then that won't necessarily be abusive. And an offer will only actually be abuse, abusive if it's so high, so far above FRAND, that it actually acts to disrupt and prejudice the negotiations themselves. So the focus in the FRAND context is what impact does this offer have on what would otherwise be the framework for negotiations between the parties to try and conclude a FRAND license. And if you've acted in a way which actually disrupts the process of concluding a license, the good faith process of negotiation, that is the circumstance in which the court will consider that there might have been excessive pricing. Obviously, again, that's going to be a question of fact, and it's going to require the court to look at all the circumstances of any particular case. And it might also depend on the nature of the parties negotiating. Uh, in Unwired Planet, the, the court emphasised in particular that sophisticated parties fully understand the process of negotiation, and so they're unlikely to be spooked merely by a, an opening high offer in, in the context of the, the process of negotiation. Moving on to a head of abuse on the next slide, which arises specifically in the FRAND context, you find that in Huawei and ZTE, which was a reference from the German court. In that case, Huawei was the holder of a standard and central patent. ZTE was marketing products using the patent, but without paying any royalties. And negotiations between them for the terms of the license had been unsuccessful. And in those circumstances, Huawei fought an action for an injunction, but the referring court was concerned that if you're seeking an injunction, Huawei might be deemed to be abusing its dominant position because it's essentially seeking to exclude a competitor from the market. The CJU essentially indicated that you have to strike a balance between enforcing IP rights and the interests of competition. And it said it recognised in principle that a refusal to licence could be raised by way of a defence to a claim for an injunction because it could in principle constitute an abuse. And it said what the, uh, the IP holder has to do in order to avoid the abuse is to grant a licence. But the problem that the Court of Justice recognised was that sometimes parties disagree as to what is the fair terms of the licence. So all the patent holder has to do is grant a licence, but it might not be within its gift to do so if there's still a dispute about the terms of the licence. So what can it do? Is it to be left in some sort of limbo because it can't enforce its IP rights because it's unable to grant a licence? And what the Court of Justice did was to set out steps by which the SEP holder can demonstrate that it's a winning licensor and ensure that on the other side of the negotiation, it has a willing licensee that isn't being unjustly excluded from the market. And I put the uh, what the court said by way of steps on the slide. What it said is that firstly, the SEP holder has to notify the infringer of the infringement. And then after the alleged infringer has indicated its willingness to con conclude a licensing agreement on FRAN terms, the licensor has to make a written offer to license on FRAN's terms. And there was a, a lengthy debate in Unwired Planet about whether these requirements are by the way of mandatory requirements, in the sense that if you don't comply with them, you're automatically falling foul of Article 102, or whether or not they were by way of a safe harbour. And Huawei in that case contended that they were mandatory, and Unwired Planet's position was that they weren't. And that was resolved by the Supreme Court. What the Supreme Court said is on the next slide. And it said that what the Court of Justice had done was to provide a route map to avoid infringing Article 102. But if the route map isn't followed, it made clear that you don't assume there's an automatic abuse. You have to look at all the facts of the case. There was also a debate about whether the licensor could satisfy its requirement to make an offer of FRAN terms if when the court ultimately comes to decide what is FRAN, the court says, actually, no, sorry, your, your offer was too high. In that circumstance, is the, uh, the patent holder deemed to have failed to comply with the requirements set out in Huawei and ZTE? And what the Supreme Court said about that was that there was no mandatory requirement that a licensor must make an offer of terms which precisely anticipate those which the court ultimately held to be frank, because it recognised that that would be completely impractical. 
what it says, what it emphasised was particularly important was that the licensor has shown itself willing to licence on whatever terms were framed. So going forward, it's to be expected that most licences will be, most licensors will be able to comply with the Huawei and ZTE requirements because they've now been clearly articulated and clarified. And so it may be that there's limited scope for debate on that particular head of abuse. But I've also flagged up some forthcoming cases that are going to be uh, looking at similar issues and potential abuses in the FRAN context. The first one on the next slide is Optus and Apple. Let's wait for the next slide. So in Optus and Apple, the court took what was the conventional case management approach in these FRAN cases, and it set down trials A to D which are technical trials where the court looks at the validity infringement of the relevant patents at the subject of the proceedings. And then it set down trial E, which is intended to deter determine the terms of a FRAND license and to address any allegations of anti-competitive conduct. And in that case, there are allegations of excessive pricing, there are allegations of bundling, and there are allegations of discrimination and such like. And all those were put down to be heard in trial E. But the court then went back and slotted in a further trial, trial F. And trial F is intended to deal with a particular allegation that a potential licensee is an unwilling licensee if it's unwilling to undertake to enter into, enter into whatever license the court determines is frowned. So the case is, if during the course of this litigation, the licensee is not prepared to say, yes, at the end of this process, I will take the license that the court says to be frowned, well, that renders the licensee an unwilling licensee, and there will be consequences if that's the finding. You would not be able to enforce the FRAND undertaking, for example. And that's, in that context, there is a, a novel allegation of abuse under Article 102, and it's said that it's abusive for the patent owner, the SEP owner, to try and compel the implementer to commit to a license before it had received an offer on FRAN terms or before it knows what the FRAN terms are. So this is going to be quite an important issue as to whether or not it's legitimate or not, including under Article 102, to require the licensee to make an undertaking to accept what the court determines to be FRAN from the outset of the proceedings. So that's an issue which is going to be heard and determined in July of this year. Just to flag up one last case, which is forthcoming, the next slide. Which and Qualcomm. Uh, this is an application to commence collective proceedings under Section 47B of the Competition Act 98. So it's the first time that Article 102 abuse allegations in the FRAND context have been the subject of proposed collective proceedings in the Competition Appeal Tribunal. The claims which it's proposed to combine in the collective proceedings are standalone claims, and they're claims of damages caused by alleged infringements of Article 102 and the Chapter 2 prohibition. And the allegation being advanced by the proposed class representative is that the respondent and the proposed defendant has leveraged a dominant position in the supply of LTE chipsets to force smartphone manufacturers across the industry to pay what are claimed to be super competitive royalties for patents and has refused to license rival chipset manufacturers under its patents. And the proposed claimant class are all consumers who purchased LTE enabled Apple and Samsung smartphones since the 1st of October 2015. And the relief sought is an aggregate award of damages. And that's obviously a uh, litigation at a very early stage, but again, raising questions of abuse of a dominant position in a patent and uh, FRAND context. So just stepping back a bit and, uh, and in conclusion, what we're seeing is a considerable vol volume of FRAND litigation coming through. And Article 102 issues tend to feature quite prominently. So an interesting body of case law is developing about what constitutes abusive context in, in this particular specific context. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, right. I think I'm now back. Now, uh, I, I omitted in my introduction to mention that uh, you will, uh, I think, depending on what, soft, what software you're using or what uh, operating system you're using, you may find a question panel at the side, on the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel, which should enable you to put any questions uh, to uh, our speakers. So uh, don't hesitate to use that, and we'll try and deal with those at the end. 
Uh, now, our second speaker is Maya Lester, QC. She specializes in competition law as well as public law, EU, and sanctions. She is going to talk more specifically in general terms about litigating big tech cases, which she can do with some authority. She's acted in various stages of both the Foundam and Street Map cases against Google and is currently involved in a new standalone claim against Microsoft. Uh, she's also acted in numerous competition cases over the years, including At the Races, Enron, Pay TV, Euribor, National Grid, Unicam, and the competition uh, cases on director's disqualification, as well, of course, as we know her, many of her from uh, her appearances in Whiteman in the Supreme Court and Cardi in the European Court of Justice. So, Maya, with that background, over to you. Let's. What have you got to say on litigating these big cases? Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And um, what I wanted to do is sort of set some of the big tech digital markets cases in a bit of context uh, and then briefly consider some issues for litigators in particular. And I'm very aware that the people dialing into this are, are vastly experienced. We have both um, economists, uh, lawyers and, and many others. So it would be wonderful if you would intervene in the in the questions function, please, and get something of a discussion going, because what I really want to do is raise a few issues for discussion. Um, Paul, if I could have the first slide, please. Um, so as uh, Sir Nicholas said, in a sense, none of this is new. Um, there have been really interesting cases, IBM onwards, about the extent to which competition law can, should, and how it should regulate um, uh, big tech digital markets for want of a, a better word. Um, but there has been an enormous amount of recent action on this front, um, really since the explosion of the internet since around 2000. Uh, and although, you know, Sir Nicholas described those early Microsoft cases now as being old hat, in a sense, the regulators and courts are still puzzling over some of the same issues that arose in those cases. Why is this? Why, why does big tech and digital markets present so many challenges for competition law? And forgive me if this is really obvious, but obviously it uh, what arises is an enormous concentration of market power in a few big players who hold sufficient market power to be able potentially to distort competition, both in the markets in which they're dominant and in other related markets. Um, also a feature of big tech and big data markets are enormous benefits for consumers on one side, but also real problems for consumers who don't, you might think, hold much power, particularly over their data, and also big potential problems for competitors uh, and barriers to entry. So you can see immediately the great potential for allegations of abuse of a dominant position. You also have, interestingly, a lot of regulators with different and overlapping portfolios, privacy regulators, data protection, consumer protection, all of these uh, overlap to a large extent with competition law. And one of the puzzles has been how far is it appropriate for competition regulators to intervene in these digital markets data cases and how far should they leave it to the other regulators? Now, of course, this is not just an EU or UK problem. This is a worldwide issue. And what is fascinating, I think, is that this is an area where the EU, rightly or wrongly, has been absolutely leading the charge. So a lot of these, uh, the big players involved are, of course, based in the US. Uh, but the most aggressive um, intervention of a regulatory nature is coming from the EU. And so what one sees both when it comes to data protection and uh, competition law regulation is that, in a sense, um, the the multinationals are having to follow EU rules to some extent, even where they're not EU players. It's the opposite of the other field where I do a lot of work, sanctions, fascinatingly, where the whole world follows the US rules because the US is a more aggressive regulator in that sphere. So at the moment, digital markets are a huge focus of the European Commission. Query, very much for discussion, is this too much? Are you know consumer issues in other fields being ignored in favor of these um, this series of big tech investigations. Uh, 
uh, because we've seen in the last few years investigations into Google, into Apple, into Facebook, into Amazon, all of the sort of big players are being actively uh, and currently investigated by the European Commission. So I simply want to touch on two things. What, firstly, what are the main issues arising under Article 102, which for those of you who don't know is the sort of legal rules that govern an abuse of a dominant position? And secondly, thoughts about issues that arise in litigation in particular. Why are there so many Article 102 cases and investigations in particular? Well, because we're dealing with unilateral conduct here. This tends not to be either merger control, you know, two or more firms joining together. And it tends not so much to be anti-competitive agreements. We're talking about the regulation of unilateral market power by often single, very dominant players. Now, some common issues and challenges are arising in a number of these cases. First and most obviously, the challenge is that the same entity is often the owner of the platform on which they're very dominant. For example, the internet search platform, Google search, Facebook. The same entity that is ultra dominant on those markets is also competing in some cases with the companies that depend on its platform. So there is a dual role as platform owner and competing retailer. That is a theme that runs throughout many of these investigations and cases because the problem that is posed is that the dominant undertaking can set the rules of a competition in a way that can potentially privilege their own products. And one of the most difficult and common themes in these investigations is what are the legal rules that should govern that problem? When is that okay? When is that not okay? The sort of language that's used in the judgments and the decisions is leveraging market power in one market to help themselves in another market, self-preferencing of products, favoring, uh, favoring. And this is a really controversial area, what the legal conditions should be. Um, what kind of abuse are we talking about? Because these sort of almost new categories of leveraging market power and self-preferencing are, are referred to in the case law. Um, and what's happening is the, the courts and the regulators are trying to work out which of the pre-existing categories that apply to abusive dominance cases uh, should those sorts of um, issues be, be seen in the light of. So some of the puzzles have been, should the case law on refusal to supply an essential facility uh, apply or not? Is that too restrictive? Does one have to show actual effects on market or just potential effects? And is that different where there are actual effects because uh, there is market information since the original case started showing, showing impact? Um, to what extent is sort of self-preferencing always anti-competitive? What about the pro-competitive big consumer benefits arising out of these ultra-dominant firms' products? When is there legitimate product improvement? Where is the line to be drawn? Because, of course, dominant firms are allowed to compete too, but when are they, in the language of, of the case law, not competing on the merits? When are they distorting the merits? Uh, and what about the abuse and use of data? Um, so um, if I could have the next slide, Paul, please, because what's interesting is how much these really important first principles have been up for grabs in the cases. So just to give a few examples, and I'm not going to go through all these, the key case in this area really is the Google Shopping European Commission decision uh, on which an appeal judgment is, is awaited. And I think that will be really interesting in setting out some of the legal rules for future cases. But um, as many of you will know, the, the European Commission um, levied a big fine for Google abusing its dominance in the market for general search services, where it's dominant, to sort of preference its own position in the comparison shopping services market, where it's not dominant. And the commission's case is basically Google is diverting traffic to its own shopping comparison um, services, and that is at least capable of having anti-competitive effects in downstream markets. Now, it's easy to say that it's a very complex decision with numerous different strands to it, but that's essentially the issue. Um, it's hotly contested on appeal, including by multiple interveners, and it raises all the interesting questions in the book. So what about this idea of, of preferencing? 
Google's case is that that whole paradigm of self-preferencing is wrong. This is simply Google's very sophisticated algorithm returning the best possible search uh, results for consumers. Um, so where is that line drawn between pro-competitive and anti-competitive? What should the remedy be? Should there be an effects analysis and so on? Um, another interesting example this time from the UK is the street map case. Um, this was a, a standalone case, i.e. not dependent on any regulatory decision, where an online mapping provider uh, brought a case suggesting that Google had abused its dominant position um, as a result of the introduction of its Google mapping product. Um, so when Google started to introduce the little map that you see, the thumbnail map, uh, as a um, as a result, as a result of a search term for a sort of geographic search, that other mapping providers' own results were demoted. And the question is, is that an abuse of a dominant position? And there's a really interesting um, judgment of Sir Peter Roth, which basically says that in theory, it is an abuse of a dominant position. And I must even this is controversial, but it is an abuse for a company to use its dominance on one market to prefer its position on another if it's not objectively justified, and that's a big if. And he likens this to supermarkets putting their own brand products prominently on its shelves uh, in its own supermarket. Um, Google, obviously dominant upstream, not in the online mapping market, but his view is if it was reasonably likely to have appreciable effects on the online mapping market, then that would be an abuse. Now, the claim failed because... Uh, of causation issues. So StreetMap was not able to show that its losses were caused by Google's uh, changes in its mapping product, um, but that Google was in fact competing on the merits, obviously a very difficult thing for the court to analyze. And the key aspect of the judgment is objective justification that the court find ult ultimately um, that uh, Google's product and the way in which it was using its mapping tool was, um, as it were, in consumer interests rather than against it. But it's really interesting on the difficulties of policing that line. The second of two current Amazon investigations by the commission also raises this issue of self-preferencing. Very briefly, there are some interesting cases on um, contract clauses. When contract clauses are restrictive of competition or an abuse of dominance, there's the German Facebook decision um, overturned by the German court uh, about uh, Facebook's collection and use of data. Um, a very scathing judgment by the German court on the Bundeskartellamt's decision, uh, but also fascinating on the issue of when is this data protection and consumer protection, when should the competition courts uh, you know, stand aside and let other regulators in. Data also very much a concern in the Commission's other Amazon investigation about Amazon's data collection. Um, the uh, new claim I mentioned against Microsoft down at the bottom of the slide there, that will be a really interesting case. A reseller of pre-owned software licenses is suggesting that Microsoft, back to Microsoft, has stifled the sale of pre-owned licenses by making discounts on certain software license upgrades conditional on agreeing not to resell software licenses. So another case about stifling the downstream market and a lack of competition on the merits. Finally, um, next slide, please, Paul, and this is the last slide. A few thoughts on issues that arise, particularly in litigating these sorts of interesting issues. First of all, um, and I'm talking mainly here about standalone actions, in other words, where you don't have a regulatory decision, a finding of violation to rely on. Um, these cases present major challenges, both for claimants and defendants. Um, first of all, funding is an obvious one, because often in the nature of these cases, you've got a David and Goliath situation. You know, how do you fund a case against such a well-resourced uh, opponent uh, as these uh, giants? Um, challenges about ATE insurance or, or funding, certainly. And also, how does one measure prospects of success at the outset of a case sufficient to satisfy a funder where there is a massive information asymmetry, something else I've put on the slide. So, of course, in 102 cases generally and in competition law generally, there is often a real asymmetry of information because um, the defendants are far more likely to know. In fact, they're the only people to know, as it were, what really happened. Uh, all of the 
disclosure will lie with them. So it's very difficult to make judgments at the outset, but, but also essential. Incentives on both sides are very different because the problem for defendants tends not to be financial. So to what extent do they, as it were, pick off through financial settlements any challenges? To what extent do they actually wish these cases to be litigated through courts to have some sort of um, certainty? Are there other incentives for claimants to bring these cases you know, public airing of the practices of the dominant companies and so on. Uh, of course, the courts and regulators try to help these sorts of access to justice problems, in particular the Competition Appeal Tribunal here with its uh, cost capping uh, and fast track type regimes. Um, just very briefly then, um, what are the competing uh, incentives to complain to regulators as opposed to courts. This is a really interesting issue. Or to what extent does one do both? So Foundham, uh, the, the main complainant in the Google Shopping case did both, had its high court claim stayed uh, now for many, many years while the commission investigates. I think the key thing here, of course, is that the public regulators are far better resourced and have far more intrusive and interesting remedial powers than private parties. The, the regulators at the moment are very interested in these big tech uh, cases, but obviously if they consider an issue to be really an inter-party commercial dispute, they may not be interested in litigating. And of course, a complaint to the regulator means that a case is out of the hands of the private parties. If you're in court, which court uh, do you bring a claim in? That's something we can talk about. Jurisdictional problems, given that most of the parties will be, or many of the parties and witnesses will be US-based. That was an issue in the recent Epic Games uh, case where the tribunal gave permission to serve out on Google, but not Apple defendants situated mainly in the US. Market definition is an issue here. Um, and very importantly, given what I said at the outset, what is the theory of harm? Because one of the main issues in these cases is which category of abuse are we talking about? Is this a sort of um, downstream foreclosure case? How is the case being framed? Has great implications for the legal test down the line. Uh, objective justification, causation, remedies, and so on. So I don't have time to say much about any of those, but I will just um, leave things, if I may, with a couple of questions for, for Aidan Robertson to take the, the reins on, because he is very interestingly going to talk now about um, some alternative solutions to the problems of big tech um, of a more regulatory kind. Um, and I won't steal his thunder, but the Treasury and the Competition and Markets Authority and the European Commission are all looking at interesting creative ways to, uh, to change the regulatory framework and bolster it. Uh, and what I, I, I guess the, the link between the two talks is you know, it seems to me that Article 102 is a very flexible tool and that all of these cases from IBM onwards have very flexibly considered the issue of how do we apply the competition law rules to this new area of big tech and um, enormous data companies. So is there a problem with the legal rules? Is there a problem with remedies? I don't see any lack of enforcement given the active nature of certainly European Commission investigations. But, um, you know, what is the problem that those regulators are seeking to address? I think it's something that um, Aidan may have something to say about. And um, thank you very much for listening. OK, well, thank you, Maya. And indeed, uh, over now to Aidan, uh, who will uh, in particular, look at the implications of some of these questions, uh, particularly in the context of the forthcoming digital markets regime in the UK. Aidan, of course, is probably well known to many of you, uh, whether as a specialist silk in competition, state aid and or subsidy control, of course, as we now call it in the UK, um, and uh, has had many distinctions, not least that of acting for the United Kingdom government in its last case before the Court of Justice as an EU member state in January 2020. Uh, a dubious honor, but uh, I'm sure a, a well-deserved one. Uh, uh, that was the Hinkley Point uh, C state aid case. Uh, case. Uh, fortunately, however, his skills will continue to be available now as a member of the Irish Bar. And of course, many of you watching may know him also as a visiting professor at Oxford University, where he has taught the postgraduate competition law course, I think since 1990 or something like that. Well, Aidan, uh, Maya has given you a few challenges. 
Uh, I see one of the questions that we've had to come in already is to talk a little bit about uh, how you think the EU DMA will impact ex post regulation. And I'm sure that you will want to be covering as well what the UK's own thoughts are on that. So are we into a new regime or is there still a place for competition law? Aidan, over to you. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our seminar. Um, well, uh, Sarah and Maya have given you their views uh, from the coal face, as it were. Uh, as the grandson of a Durham miner, I'd like to get into the metaphorical pit cage and return to the surface in order to scan the horizon to see what developments may be coming uh, in this area of antitrust and to attempt, if I can, uh, to venture some uh, observations in response to Maya and to the uh, question that one of the members uh, uh, of our audience has posed. Um, now, Maya has been talking about um, EU regulation, um, but the issue of big tech and big data has, of course, prompted much debate and research in the UK. So that's why I want to take a, a brief look at the implica implications for antitrust litigation of the UK digital markets regime. Next slide, please. Just to, by way of a wash and brush up of where we've got to. Well, this is a topic that's been looked at in the UK um, in depth, really, since uh, March 2019, the Furman report. We then had a CMA market study on online platforms, digital marketing, marketing sorry, digital advertising in July 2020 unsurprisingly finding that competition isn't working well in those markets and identifying areas of consumer harm. In particular, the market study recommended that the government passes legislation to establish a new pro-competition regulatory regime. And that led to the announcement in the budget in March 2020 of a digital markets task force to provide advice to the government on that topic. So the digital markets task force, it's led by or was led by the CMA, and supported by expertise from Ofcom and the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, they now continue to work together through the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. Next slide. So the DMTF's uh, remit here is set out uh, there. I won't go through it in the interests of uh, time, but it's set out on that slide. So I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, so what's happened is in December 2020, the Digital Markets Task Force issued its advice to the government on the design and implementation of the proposed new pro-competition regulatory regime for digital markets. Um, and the CMA hasn't sort of stood back and uh, waited for legislation to be drafted and put into place. It's keeping the pressure on in this area by opening an investigation in January this year into Google's proposals to remove third-party cookies and other functionalities from its Chrome browser, the so-called privacy sandbox, identifying concerns about the impact on newspaper publishing, digital advertising, uh, and also identifying privacy concerns. Uh, not, you'd have thought, uh, mainstream antitrust concerns, but that's another topic for the CMA. The CMA has also refreshed its digital market strategy in February of this year and uh, has now established the digital markets unit within the CMA earlier this month. It's on a non-statutory basis. It'll be put on a statutory basis when we get the legislation, but it's up and running. When are we going to get the legislation? Well, we'll find out in the Queen's speech on the 11th of May this year. Um, what I just want to cover is what the regime will look like what implications does it have for antitrust litigation in the UK? And I'll try and remember to answer Maya's question at the end as well. So next slide, please. Now, the main focus for the DMU is establishing a strategic market status regime. So the idea is to identify those platform firms which have strategic market status um, that involves setting up a methodology and a procedure for doing that, and um, then making firms with SMS subject to a pro-competitive, there goes that phrase again, code of conduct. Um, and this will also include interactions with other proposed codes and regulations. Um, 
Now, as well as the code of conduct, which I'll come on to in a minute, the market study uh, also proposed that the DMU should have the power to introduce pro-competitive interventions to transform competition in digital platform markets. And that also forms part of the DMTF's December 2020 report to government. So, next slide, please. What do we mean by strategic market status? What, what are the appropriate criteria? It's a bit inexact, I've got to say. Uh, the Furman report referred to significant market power, strategic bottleneck, gateway, relative market power, economic dependence. Um, the DMTF has come up with a, uh, a, a new test, which um, doesn't actually replicate any of those exactly. It's come up with a test of substantial entrenched market power in at least one digital activity. Um, from, if I were drafting the legislation, I'd drop the entrenched. Um, I think that's inherent in the concept of substantial market power anyway. And substantial market power at least carries with it uh, a reference back to telecommunications where that's been a test that has been used for, for, for a long time. And I, I wouldn't, for myself, see much sense in adding a higher threshold that somehow it's got to be entrenched. Um, but we'll see what the... Um, We'll see what the government come, uh, comes up with. Um, the process for, for designation, well, there'll be a process. It'll involve, in all likelihood, a, prov a provisional decision, a bit like a statement of objections, really, um, upon which the um, firm can respond. Uh, there'll be a publishing, a reasoned decision on SMS, and there'll have to be an avenue for appeal or review of the designation. Next slide, please. So that's SMS. SMS firms are going to be subject to a code of conduct. How, how many firms are likely to be subject to SMS? Well, um, the DMU um, or officials in the CMA have predicted five or six. I think they, they take to the view that Google and Facebook have SMS against any reasonable test. Uh, other firms that may be in the firing line for SMS would include Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Um, we wait to see. But they're going to be subject to a mandatory code of conduct. Uh, and uh, this will be enforced by the DMU. So it'll have powers to suspend, block, reverse decisions of SMS firms, and order conduct in order to achieve compliance with the code. It's said to be principled-based regulation through specific objectives. This is thought to make the regime somehow proof against future rapid market change, uh, but it'll be spelled out in a lot more detail through uh, guidance. Next slide, please. So the three code of objectives. First one is fair trading. Um, now, fair trading, that'll be a, that's a blast. Uh, from the past, for those of us who have long enough memories. If Sir Gerald Barling uh, is uh, attending the seminar, then he'll recall acting for British Telecoms, challenging a fair trading condition imposed upon British Telecom in the late 1990s by Oftel, uh, a case that went up to the divisional court. I remember it well because uh, it was my first ever uh, trip out on a commercial judicial review as a baby junior counsel to Oftel. Um, this fair trading condition is going to, uh, in, is intended to address concerns around the potential for exploitative behavior on the part of the SMS platform. And I underline exploitative. We're into the language of abuse. And this, the uh, matters that they're concerned with, data gathering from business customers, concerns relating to exploitation of auction algorithms, unfair balance of power between publishers and platforms, all forms of exploitative, well, abuse. Next slide, please. 
The second code objective is open choices. And these principles are intended to address the potential for exclusionary behavior, covering both contractual and technology, technological restrictions. Exclusionary behavior, again, we're in the language of abuse. Um, and the concerns here are self-preferencing in ad tech and specialized research, restrictions on interoperability, um, the other matters set out on that slide. Next slide, please. And the third uh, objective, trust and transparency. Trust and transparency principles designed to ensure that SMS platforms provide sufficient information to users so they're able to make informed decisions. Um, and the, the concerns here are about platforms changing how core services work without due notices, changing algorithms without notice, for example, lack of transparency into digital advertising in relation to fees and verification matters, uh, and use of choice architecture to nudge users towards platforms preferred choices. So uh, again, market distorting behavior. We're in the, uh, the uh, scope of abuse. Um, under traditional Article 102, Chapter 2 analysis. Turn to the next slide, please. Um, there'll be monitoring and investigation once the code's in operation, um, and this will all be done by the DMU. It's the process has uh, is likely to have um, strong similarities to antitrust investigations by the CMA. So provisional decision, i.e. statement of objections, consultation on that, um, and there's a lot of detail to be fleshed out uh, here. Um, importantly, information gathering powers, uh, because there's massive asymmetry information between the platforms uh, and the uh, DMU. Next slide, please. Now we get to remedies. Well, there are public remedies, and then there are private remedies. The public remedies will be, um, as one would expect, interim measures, they're interim code orders. Um, this is something that's uh, in the antitrust field is back up on the top of the agenda for the CMA. Well, we will be faced with this here. Final code orders, enforceability, that be an appeals regime or a review regime against interim and final orders, and the availability of fines for breaches of the code. Again, so far, so antitrust like. So, the final slide, please. That brings us to private remedies because there's also considerable scope for private enforcement, including claims for damages. Now, just to stand back, SMS looks like dominance. So designation of SMS is a designation that that firm is dominant. Breach of code. Well, I've tried to outline that there are parallels between the objectives and uh, uh, abuse. So breach of code equals abuse. Uh, indeed, it might be that these could be cat categorized by as, as abuse by object. Uh, for those of you who um, uh, also attended the first of these uh, seminars, there was a very interesting discussion between uh, our colleagues, Robert O'Donoghue QC and David Bailey about the emerging concept of abuse by object, uh, the Lithuanian Railways case being the, the poster child for this. Um, so you can see how you can uh, construct abuse of dominance claims around breaches of the code. Now, what do you do by way of getting uh, damages? Well, Fandom and Streetmap will tell you, don't take on Google on your own. Uh, well, they probably won't tell you that, but that's the message I take. I, I think you're really into the area here of enforcement through collective proceedings under Section 47B. Uh, of the Competition Act, both uh, in terms of opt-out claims by businesses, opt-out claims by consumers. As Sarah uh, explained in her contribution earlier on, uh, we see the first of uh, uh, these types of claims coming in the uh, which against Qualcomm case, uh, which has just been filed uh, with the tribunal. Now, I think the, the reason why I emphasize coll collective proceedings is the reason why platform firms have such market power is network effects. How do claimants get network effects? Well, the answer is opt out collective proceedings. You act on behalf of a class of businesses, a class of consumers, and to get proper network effects, these have to be 
opt-out proceedings. Um, there are cases going through the tribunal at the minute, uh, trucks, uh, where the hearing's just finished, where there's discussion about whether claims should be on an opt-in or opt-out basis. It's also arising in the foreign exchange uh, collective proceedings uh, cases, uh, one of which I'm acting in, which come before the tribunal in July later this year. So there's going to be a lot of learning on this. Um, so you can bring these claims follow on from a finding of code breach, or you can bring them indeed as standalone collective proceedings, as which have done, uh, and uh, you also see currently before the tribunal in the Gutman uh, Southwest Trains train tickets cases. My final topic, measure of damages. Well, if you're a business or a class of businesses that's been adversely affected and has lost out uh, as a result of abuse of dominance by a platform firm, compensatory damages would appear to be the uh, normal uh, measure of damages. You've suffered, your business has suffered, you get compensation. For consumers, a lot of this, a lot of the concerns here are about uh, use of consumer data, which is not something that has a value in the consumer's hand. No individual consumer uh, can necessarily say, here's my data, this is what it's worth. But when collectively uh, put together uh, and exploited by a platform firm, it does have a great deal of, of value. And therefore, in US litigation against Facebook, the claims that are being brought there are for disgorgement of Facebook's profit made by uh, its wrongful use, it is alleged, of uh, consumer data by Facebook. The problem facing a restitutionary disgorgement of profits claim in this case is that we've got um, Court of Appeal Authority and Devonish Nutrition from 2008 that says competition law damages are compensatory rather than restitutionary. I think it's time to revisit that authority because that is predates the consumer rights collective proceedings claim by seven years, I just don't think that's uh, any longer appropriate. And there are grounds for distinguishing it, which uh, are explored by, I think, a very important article by Professor Rachel Mulheron in the 2018 Restitution Law Review, um, uh, to which uh, reference is made at the um, end of my slide. Now, to come to Maya's uh, question and the question that was posed in the chat box, um, this is the UK regime. Uh, the EU regime being set up under the uh, Digital Markets Act uh, and also the um, uh, proposals for single market for digital services, um, I think they, they will allow um, for a similar approach to um, abuse of dominance claims under EU law. Um, I think the UK is going to be ahead of the game uh, on this. Um, simply because the, uh, it has a legislative procedure that uh, probably uh, uh, enables action to be, or well, enables the legislation to be put in place um, uh, sooner than will happen at European level. But certainly there's going to be, um, I think, an equivalent discussion about these sorts of claims at European level. Of course, the problem that you will have in most places in Europe is that they don't have a Section 47B regime uh, as, um, as so effectively uh, it is emerging that we have uh, under the, uh, the Competition Act, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court's judgment in Merricks last year. So, um, uh, Nicholas, I'm, I've, that's, I've got to the end of uh, my presentation. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with the words with, in which I concluded the UK's observations before the Court of Justice in the Hinkley Point case in January last year. In the words of another barrister, no longer practicing, that is that, the end. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, th thank you for dealing with, with uh, at least one of the questions. Uh, I, there's a very interesting question that's come in uh, from uh, a, another uh, member of the audience asking, uh, are the implications of, uh, for the financing of cases by third party financers, uh, financers uh, when the claims involve effectively an existential threat to the business model of the company uh, concerned? Um, Maya, a, a response to that. It's a, it's a very interesting thought, isn't it? 
it is a very interesting thought. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, you could say it's in the nature of some of these claims. If you're complaining about something that happens as a, as a result of the Google algorithm or, you know, Google mapping, preferencing, those are very fundamental aspects of the product. Um, and it's so it's difficult to see how a claim in that case, if that's your complaint, could be put in a narrower way. And it's difficult to avoid a situation in which the, um, you know, the dominant undertaking really needs to fight this uh, tooth and nail and, and, of course, has the funds to do it. But I definitely think it's a very interesting thought for claimants is should we focus on a narrower version of this claim so that it becomes settleable? And indeed, does the claimant want to settle it or is it an issue that if they have the funding or if it's a collective um, attempt that they actually wish the issue of principle to be litigated as far as they can get it or yep. investigate? Yes, there may be a tension there possibly between the funder's objectives and the, uh, the claimants, particularly if they're an organisation, consumer association or whatever, who may, have a, may want to see a, a definitive result. Yes. Uh, Aidan or Sarah, have you any thoughts on that one? I need to say that settlement ought to be the answer to existential threats. <laughs> and, and, that, and that settlement is inherently a strategy in collective proceedings. Yes, yes. Sarah? I, I would just add that I think these entities are likely to fight tooth and nail in any event. I think it's not only what may be classed as existential threats. I think realistically these sorts of challenges, competition law challenges are divisive and, and they're not they're not going to be met lightly. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Um, I, I think we've uh, pretty well covered it. I see people are starting to drop off now, no doubt as, uh, the, as the lunch uh, break. And thank you for spending your lunch break with us on, on this uh, fascinating discussion of which uh, no doubt we'll hear more. Um, I imagine that the slides will be available, uh, I imagine, on, on our uh, web, uh, Chamber's website, uh, if any of you want to look at it. And uh, otherwise, as they also say, thank you for listening. So uh, goodbye and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.